So I think, you know, good idea. I, my hope is just to try and frame the debate and then stay the heck out of it, really. Um, I think it's very easy when we sort of talk about something that's been going on now just in terms of what Snowden's revealed for four or five months to sort of forget the broad scope of what they are. And I think it's very useful to think about, firstly, the stories, the issues, and actually the approach that sort of Edward Snowden, Ray Greenwald, The Guardian, and actually The Washington Post, the other outlets that have come and have taken, because I think a lot of that gets ignored in actually quite a damaging way. So really, the sort of core of these revelations, and The Guardian alone has done about four or five hundred stories on this now, so if you want to wade into the detail, it's all online, we've tried to make it as navigable as possible. But we've really covered sort of four or five core issues. The first of that, is, abs is a large-scale set of surveillance based on cable in intercepts. We knew to an extent that the US had done this, and then stopped doing this, did it again, and stopped doing it, and they're doing it again, and essentially constantly under different legal authorizations. We also revealed for the first time that the UK has a very similar operation called Tempora, which is based around buffering the internet. It's essentially a sky plus for the internet, um, which holds content for about three days and metadata for about a month. America actually holds metadata for a lot longer, a year. And the thing is, there's a nice glib way of explaining metadata. It's the envelope. It's not what's inside it. And that kind of sounds fine when you're thinking about a letter, unless it's, you know, maybe a love letter to someone illicit. But when you think about it in other contexts, it gets a lot creepier. Like, if I start thinking about where I've been at every hour of every day for the last months. I kind of think if I could tell you either that or what I said in those places, the content, I don't know which I would regard as more invasive. And essentially both the US and the UK have made this decision that who we speak to, where we go, how long we stay there is not particularly private information. Um, there's also then fairly large scale surveillance programs, so generally referred to as PRISM, based on taking information directly from the servers of US internet companies. Um, directly is a slightly controversial word here. It's, depending on your interpretations, it's either a semi-automated or largely automated process of electronic requests and transfers based without warrant. This guy runs there. Or sort of other arrangements administered by the FBI. And these are pretty large scale too. And as far as the analyst is concerned, they type in a few things in the form, they hit a button, the data comes to them. They don't have to start presenting a lot of information to court. And some of us think that's an issue. The kind of, the broader one, and the one that sort of does and doesn't impact on privacy is the attitude towards cryptography. And this is maybe the most complicated story, the one that managed to get us sort of stuff from every side. Um, this is essentially the idea that Encryption is the standard upon which really privacy is based online, security is based online. It's what keeps everything secure in transit, it's what sort of protects your bank details, it's what protects your insurance details if you put those in. It's, you know, anytime you see a padlock in your browser, that's encryption. And through a string of sort of techniques, the NSA hasn't just been doing code breaking, it's a code breaking agency. You know, in Britain we celebrate Alan Turing for breaking codes. It's not a shock that agencies do that. But they've been circumventing it. They've been actually lowering the standards on which all of these security, all of this security is based, which affects open source, which affects every user. There's no way to do that without dropping everyone's security. And bear in mind, both GCHQ and the NSA, in their respective countries, are responsible for cyber security. So they're simultaneously in charge of raising security and lowering it. I think that's actually quite a significant tension. They're also working with commercial providers to put in backdoors or weaknesses or vulnerabilities, even either overtly or covertly. Again, that can be something of a problem, especially when you're trying to build your economy on Silicon Valley, on being a tech giant, and you're trying to take stewardship of the internet <coughs> as a kind of as a safe holder, as someone who won't abuse that. There's then essentially the diplomatic issue of 
quite extensive spying programs on world leaders and on politicians. I think some of the questions around there were actually addressed quite early on where this isn't just listening into the phone calls of friendly world leaders in case they mention the terror plot that you haven't heard about. This is sort of the classic kind of stuff of listening to, you know, I think one of the examples was at G20, listening into the South African de delegation to get a slight advantage in trade talks. I mean, with a much poorer country that's a supposed ally, these are quite marginal calls. And again, that's kind of for decisions to be made. So I think the issues that raised, I'm sorry, I'm probably talking for far too long here, but um, the issues that that raised are essentially, there's the practical ones. We're sort of building history's largest haystack. You know, the size of these files dwarf anything that the Stasi could have managed because we generate a lot more information on ourselves. Is that practical? If we're looking for a fixed number of needles, a fixed number of terrorists, does expanding the haystack by a factor of 10 make us safer? I mean, the argument so far on how many plots have been followed by such large-scale surveillance are quite shaky. Don't forget, 9-11 did not happen because the <coughs> signal's intelligence was not picked up. It was because it was not acted upon. And now we get a much larger volume of signals. But there's also what happens when you pull in that much stuff and you do algorithmic automated testing on it. It pulls in people. At some point, you know, you might buy fertilizer at a similar time as you call your friend Mohammed and you have happened to travel to the Middle East on a sightseeing tour of uh, some old ruins. You know, that might just not be a good pattern. I'm using a very crude example, but there's times where you, you may get picked up, you may get read, you may have your backstory gone into. And no one does nothing that they're not a little bit sort of private about. Anyone who kind of says privacy doesn't matter, you know, ask them to hand over the mobile phone and read out their text to a room. Um, not many people have taken me up on that, and I've, I've made the challenge a while. Uh, uh, no, I won't. Um, but, you know, this, just because the very fact it's there actually really redefines the idea of suspicionless surveillance is quite a big cultural decision, and it might be something we decide as a society we're happy with. But the crucial thing is, cabinet ministers in the National Security Council were not aware of these programs. So the politicians weren't doing the oversight. The European Court of Human Rights was not specifically made aware of this. We, we are signatories to the Human Rights Act for now. That means we are subject to that act. We've never had a chance to test this. The Intelligence and Security Committee in America certainly is saying that they weren't aware of a lot of these programs. So we are in a democratic society where neither the politicians, the lawyers, the judges, or the legislatures knew what was going on. So who is making these decisions? Quite big, broad cultural decisions for us. You might say, okay, it's not, it shouldn't be in the hands of a 29-year-old security contractor and the editors of The Guardian, Washington Post, New York Times. Well. It shouldn't, no, but it's where it's ended up. Um, so we have those kind of issues. Is it making us safer? Is it helping our privacy? Are we accountable? I think the final thing to know is just this is painstakingly reported. This is not read a document, report a document. This has had, you know, the encryption story had a whole team of very experienced national security reporters drawing on every contact they had, every source they had, weeks of sort of cross analysis, cross work to work out every line, every word from huge ranges of documents. This is really, really painstaking, difficult journalism. That's also why it takes a long time. But this sense, and then we have had discussions with the governments, with the intelligence agencies in all the countries affected for each story. We have absolutely thought through the public interest of every line of every document we have published. And what we have published is well below what we've read. And always, always with the rationale of, is this, inter not, is this interesting or is this a great front page? But does this do something significant to further a debate? And that's actually what Edward Snowden said he wanted to do. He was fully aware he could put out the documents on, or he could force the NSA and GCHQ to change their practices just by revealing it and you know, as we've heard from everyone, just doing that would cripple such programs. He chose and said publicly right at the beginning he wasn't going to do it that way. We haven't been doing it that way. And 
that's kind of the context this is in. This is painstakingly, responsibly reported. And if you listen to the debate anywhere else in the world, you know, America is having a debate now where the NSA's greatest champion, Diane Feinstein, has said, we have to review every intelligence program the US carries out. In Europe, Angela Merkel, uh, France Hollande are calling on other European leaders to call them for treaty level discussions on what's legitimate for spying on them, <coughs> spying on their civilians, well, their civilians, their citizens. In the UK, we seem to be talking about whether the Guardian is a bunch of rogues. <laughs> Take what you can get. Anyway, I think that's set it out, and I'll let everyone else say what it all means because they know. <coughs> but...